Hey everyone, how's it going? It's going great, thank you, John. How are you? Hello. Can't complain. Doing all right. Figure we'll give it a couple more minutes. People still joining? Hello, everyone. We were on a diff different meeting, so sorry about that. No worries. Yeah, waiting for Faye and Glenn, we were in different meetings, so they're joining soon. A uh, little bit under the weather. <laughs> All right, let's get started here. And then as everyone joins and gets settled in, uh, should be in good shape. So uh, I think the lion and the fear are here. I'm oh, here, great. finally. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, welcome. <clears throat> Sorry, we were we were uh, on the team meeting waiting and I realized, oh, this is Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling, so. All right, so we're gonna kick things off here. I'm gonna be facilitating the meeting today. It is my first time, so feedback is welcome. Just a few quick things before we get into today's presentation. Uh, so as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube afterwards. Your participating participation in these meetings is an agreement to abide by the Cloud Native Security Code of Conduct, which can be found in the Tag Security repo. Do I have anyone who's willing to volunteer as a scribe? Yeah, I mean, are we, are we going to start talking about, uh, you know, uh, the Open Zero Trust project, right? As if I get it correctly. Yeah. Sure. Once we get through the initial kickoff and a couple other small items, we'll we'll leave plenty of time for the presentation. Yep. So if anyone is willing to pick up one of the scribe uh, roles, I will throw into the chat here a link to our notes. Uh, and a little bit down, you can see uh, scribe one and scribe two. Uh, please feel free to start noting our actions and the primary content. Since, like we said, this is being recorded. So we really just want a text searchable notes available in there. All right, uh, moving on. We do have a presentation today that we'll hit at the end, for the Open Zero Trust project. But before we do that, are there any, is there anybody new on the call that wants to do a introduction? All right, yeah, seeing a lot of familiar faces. Uh, so second, we have project updates. So do we have any updates from any of the projects? Feel free to raise your hand or just speak up. Okay. 
Uh, right. Maybe I can tell you something. Uh, I, I volunteered uh, last week to start working on the possible version of the website for the group. And I've prepared something using Jekyll and GitHub pages. Uh, I think it still needs a little more work, but I will share what I am doing in a, in a repo I prepared in the, in the ticket for it. And if you want to see maybe what I've been doing, I can also show it to you if you have time. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else? Any of the projects? The controls project has been seeing some good progress lately. We're a few meetings into our phase two kickoff and looking at some collaborations with other groups, including the open SSF. So that will be really good and interesting. And we have some tasks as well to map to newer versions of the upstream documents. The cloud native security white paper V2 is on our list of things to review. So things are moving along there nicely. Cool. All right. Pretty straightforward then. Uh, so we can pass it over for the presentation now. So who's going to be sharing? Feel free to take over the share if you can. Sure. Can I hear our mute? <clears throat> Okay, I'll share and then uh, Faye will um, talk to the first few slides. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet, meet you. And a uh, very quick <clears throat> introduction before we get started. Uh, my name is Fei Huang. I'm a security, uh, a head of a security strategy in SUSE. And uh, before SUSE, we came from New Vector, which is a container security uh, company. We were acquired by SUSE uh, end of last year. And, uh, you know, as a part of the journey to SUSE, uh, you know, it's open source company. So we, to, we try to contribute to New Vector, originally a commercial product, right? Uh, trying to convert that to the open source project step by step. And then we're also submitting the project to CNCF because it's all around the Kubernetes security. Uh, that's why today we are here, happy to get a chance to you know, talk about the new vector, talk about the Open Zero Trust, which is a really core uh, piece of the, of the new vector product and the you know, technologies. Uh, together with me, uh, our you know, head of engineering, uh, Gary, uh, and also our you know, head of PM, uh, Glenn Kosaka, uh, they will help me together. We will present this Open Zero Trust project for everybody. And uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, raise your hand, ask any questions when you have. Uh, we will just follow the typical flow here to talk about more about technology and, uh, you know, technical details around Open Zero Trust. Okay, I'll get started. So uh, Open Zero Trust is a, a new name, but it's an, it's, it's an existing project for a few years already, right? As I mentioned, it came from New Vector which is a full lifecycle container security platform. I will explain what the full lifecycle container security means in our kind of angle. Uh, Glenn, can you go to the next slide, please? So, I mean, in the overall picture, what do we do, right? What are the capabilities? We basically think about the security from, uh, you know, build, uh, build, uh, build, ship, run kind of, you know, um, workflow. In the build time, uh, developers commit all the code into repository, into the GitHub, GitLab, right? And there's a uh, CICD pipeline kicks in, right? That's the time we try to, you know, start doing some security for the, for the you know, process. For example, New Vector have a built-in, I mean, sorry, Open Zero Trust have a built-in continuous vulnerability scanner. This scanner, you know, it's no difference from other, you know, uh, scanners in the market, but it does have some uniqueness inside the project. It can do container scan, image scan, it can scan the repo, it can scan the multiple layers, it can also, also scan the host. It's not only about container and container image, it also scans your container hosts at the runtime, right? It will monitor, it will actually actively monitor all the running environment 
for example, when something changed inside the container, when something like a new package was downloaded live, right? Our scanner will, autom will automatically kick in and do a quick scanning on the new modules. Or if there are some database changes, for example, a new CVE being published from one of the source and the way uh, uh, you know, grab that information right away, we were able to reassessment the whole environment. Doesn't matter if it's a, you know, it's a repo environment or it's a live environment. So we call it a continuously vulnerability scanning and monitoring. So this is one feature inside the Open Zero Trust. And also we do com compl uh, continuous compliance scanning. Compliance scanning is more than just a CVE scan, right? So we all understand that we do CIS benchmark, for example, we do the Kubernetes benchmark, we do the Docker benchmark, we do all the security checks in the life cycle. It's not just a one-time thing, it's not a snapshot. It basically continues the monitoring the whole environment, check your Docker runtime, check your container D, check your Kubernetes orchestrator, check your host as well, right? So all those are continuously checking monitoring. This is another piece of capabilities. Then the next one is admission control, which is extension of Kubernetes, you know, uh, admission control capability. We basically connect the dots together. We can connect the CVE scan results, right? Back to this admission control policies. So we were able to, you know, have a more better ways to, to uh, control the security policies, to give you a, a, admin, a chance to decide what kind of images can be deployed what kind of containers can be, you know, ac can access the, the, the real environment. Then I wanna really emphasize about behavior learning and the zero trust policy. This is really the core piece of the open zero trust project. Why we call it open zero trust? Because we believe the, the traditional way of, you know, signature based the scanning uh, uh, reactive model of security is kind of out of date. It's really hard to catch the zero days, right? The new CVEs. So the new model we call zero trust proactive security model. The general idea is like, we can understand the container runtime behavior. The runtime behavior includes, for example, the network behavior, the layer seven behaviors, like which application talk to which application, which service is talking to, you know, another services on what kind of protocols, right? Layer seven protocols. Also the file access, also the process patterns. All of those behaviors together, kind of like a fingerprint of that application service. Once microservices was in the running state, we were able to automatically learn that. We can also import that behavior from the repo, from the, you know, uh, customization. And that behavior become a fingerprint, become a zero trust kind of policy we will lock that down when it's become, you know, a uh, relatively solid policy. You can switch the button, see, okay, this MongoDB container behavior is, is learned. It looks, it looks uh, you know, very, very good. Then we can lock it down. So once we lock it down, which means all the, all the behavior is, is allow list, right? Anything beyond that allow list, we will treat as a suspicious behavior. It will be blocked, reject, you know, if you are in the monitor only mode, we're gonna raise alarm, but we will still let, let it go, let it work. So there's a different security mode to control the, you know, the restriction levels of the policy. So this is really around what we call zero trust policy, auto-generating and the enforcement. The, the beauty of here I wanna emphasize is really the runtime enforcement piece. It's not just, you know, check the abnormal behaviors and the, and you know, notice administrators. It's really, we see something really bad. Like uh, uh, for example, a layer seven DDoS attack to a container. We were able to quickly, you know, realize that a suspicious behavior and block that right away. A little bit of tension on that concept is if we not only monitor the container runtime behavior, we are also monitoring the host runtime behavior. For example, if a MongoDB container somehow, right, in the kill chain, it, it launch a process in the host, which is doing something really weird it never did before, this will be counted as suspicious behavior on the host. And we will kill that process if the policy is in the blocking mode, right? 
So those are the kind of zero trust uh, uh, policy, uh, you know, uh, model. I hope that uh, gave you a, a general idea. Uh, Glenn gonna talk uh, uh, into the details or even show a little bit demo around that. This is one major, I think it's a, one of the major runtime security uh, in our offering. And the last thing I wanna uh, <coughs> mention is uh, security as code is automation. This one was uh, a new vector extended the CRD for Kubernetes. So we were able to, you know, through Kubernetes CRD, we were able to, you know, <clears throat> define the layer seven zero trust policies, which gives developers a chance to, you know, write down their uh, application behaviors or security policies at the beginning. You can even check in that policy into GitHub, GitLab, right, as a manifest. And this once new actor system pick that up, right, from Kubernetes, we're gonna do the, all the enforcement at the runtime. So, so all those are the highlights of the product offering the capabilities, you know, any, any questions, please feel free to, you know, to, uh, to raise your hand. Okay, I think we can go on then. Uh, Glenn, you wanna go to the next slide? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm gonna dive into a few details. And again, if uh, anyone has any questions, just uh, uh, pipe up. <clears throat> Um, so this is a little bit about the architecture. As Faye mentioned, it's a pure cloud native technology. So it's all containers. Uh, think of New Vector as just another application um, that's deployed on top of a Kubernetes cluster, um, all containerized. And so uh, a couple things before we get into the details is um, this supports, of course, Kubernetes. Uh, native deployment, but also deployment on all of the popular or using all of the popular orchestration platforms. Um, in fact, prior to the acquisition, most of our customers were running on OpenShift, <clears throat> uh, but we also had a few rancher customers and then of course many public clouds. So GKE, EKS, AKS, and even IBM cloud customers. Um, and, and we had a few that were uh, on ECS as well as uh, running just Docker native, Docker Run or Docker Compose, um, which is now Mirantis. So New Vector is truly cross-platform. Uh, and even though we are part of kind of the Rancher brand now, we will continue to uh, support uh, uh, this um, project on all platforms. So um, the architecture is actually very similar to Kubernetes. Um, there's a control plane. There's one, uh, the, you know, the default deployment is three, but it could be odd numbers, five, seven, or even just one. Uh, three for HA, and there's a, a leader that's um, elected. <clears throat> And now the vulnerability scanning, image scanning, uh, runtime scanning, that's all done by a separate container, which is called the scanner. And uh, when the scanner is connected to the controller, the controller doles out uh, scan jobs to any of the available scanners. So that also can scale up as a replica set to, uh, I think the default may be two or three, but you can go to 10 if you need to scan uh, 10,000 images in a registry, uh, you know, within a day, then you can have as many scanners scale up as, as needed and the controller will manage all those scan jobs. In addition to that, uh, Faye mentioned that you can uh, build a vulnerability scanning into the pipeline into, so there's Jenkins plugins, Azure DevOps extensions, Circle CI orbs, um, that will trigger the new vector scanner. So in those cases, the scanner is just run as a single uh, container. It doesn't require the controller or any other container. So it can be deployed just by itself on its own, especially if you're using it to do uh, scanning as a developer or in the build pipeline. Uh, and in the build pipeline, let's say it's a Jenkins plugin, it will then invoke the scanner, you know, essentially Docker run that scanner, scan that image, uh, if, let's say it's on the local machine, and then return the scan results to the Jenkins plugin uh, and then bring down the scanner. 
So it's kind of scan on demand. And then uh, within the Jenkins plugin, uh, the, the user can set things like fail the build if there's a critical vulnerability with a fix available and it's more than seven days old. Um, so a, a number of different um, policies you could do to fail the build and send it back to, to development uh, to be remediated before it's again sent down the pipeline. <clears throat> And the kind of the workhorse and the runtime security components that uh, Faye talked about is done by the enforcer. This is deployed as a daemon set, so one on every uh, schedulable node. Some um, users do deploy on the uh, master server or the OpenShift infra servers um, to monitor the API server and other system containers. Uh, but on a public cloud, obviously, it would just be on the worker nodes. And the enforcer is really doing all of the packet inspection that Faye talked about, all of the deep packet inspection, uh, monitoring pod-to-pod -pod communication, ingress and egress, um, network connections, um, as well as monitoring each workload's uh, process and file activity. So if anything needs to be alerted or blocked, even the enforcer is going to do that. And the alert will be sent to the controller. So the enforcers all register to the controller set um, and, uh, and then receive their rules or any updates from the controller. Um, but if the controller goes down, the enforcer can still run and protect uh, that host. Um, just so, just to be clear, it's not a sidecar art type of architecture. It doesn't require sidecar. It's uh, one container per node is doing all of the uh, inspection of the network traffic as well as um, pod uh, um, process and file activity as well as host activity. So monitoring host processes, scanning host um, for vulnerabilities and other actions itself. Um, other things about the technology, um, you know, Gary, our, our um, engineering head and CTO, comes from Fortinet, where he wrote the deep packet inspection engines for the firewalling technology. So our um, deep packet inspection is 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 uh, developed by Gary and his team. Um, so all the packet inspection, deep packet inspection, is used um, by the enforcer, and it's it's you know, kind of in this project's technology. Um, we don't use uh, technologies such as uh, network policy to enforce or IP tables to enforce, uh, nor do we use eBPF for network enforcement. We do um, use eBPF to monitor processes and help us better uh, isolate uh, the relevant uh, container processes. Uh, but if eBPF is not available on the host, it's uh, we don't rely on that. So <clears throat> completely optional. And uh, the manager, and I'll show you the web console, is a stateless um, you know, web UI uh, that connects to the controller um, using a REST API to, um, so if you go into the manager and do any type of activity, it's going to use the REST API to do to affect that in the controller. Uh, so the manager is optional. Uh, New Vector can be completely managed uh, through the REST API. And uh, it can be deployed, uh, obviously, through Helm charts, through operators, um, config maps to do the initial configuration. Um, uh, what else? <laughs> uh, as far as the deployment. Um, the the um, we we kind of build in um, uh, integration with the various container runtimes. So uh, we do support all of the popular container runtimes. So of course, Container D, Cryo, um, the old Docker one as well, um, AWS Bottle Rocket. Um, the the issue with that is there are sometimes some um, different uh, location that the Docker SOC or the container D SOC is located, which we mount. So uh, that's why during deployment, you would tell us what container runtime you're deploying. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so that's new vector uh, when it's deployed. And, you know, obviously if, um, if there's uh, an actual deployment, then um, you will see all the pods, um, three controller pods, the daemon set enforcers, uh, the manager. Oh, uh, and then here we have three scanners. There is something called an updater. It's kind of um, really all it does is it restarts the scanner. Um, and the reason the scanner uh, need, wants to be restarted on a cron job, typically daily, is because in the scanner pod is where we publish the latest CVE database. So, um, ev you know, every day there could be new CVEs, uh, and and Faye will or will show you what what our CVE sources are. But um, so we update that, and it's it's in the scanner uh, image. And so we publish the you know a latest scanner image every day. So on a cron job, typically uh, a user would this just update, uh, have it update every day, pull the latest scanner image, and then their CVE database is updated. <sighs> okay. Um, I won't go in too much into detail, but each of the, you know, roughly we recommend a minimum of gig of uh, RAM and, and a shared CPU is fine for each of the components. However, um, the scanner, for example, if you're scanning five gigabyte images, then the scanner needs uh, a little bit more than that because it's got to expand the image. Uh, if the controller is managing um, thousands of nodes, um, one of our partners, um, IBM Cloud, um, tested us to a thousand node um, scalability. Um, it's going to put more, um, you know, as each enforcer registers, it's going to put more uh, demand on the controller. So you may uh, increase that memory, double it or triple it. So as you uh, characterize your, your environment, you can then, you know, manage the request and limits for each of the components. <laughs> Um, the enforcer is um, doing packet inspection. And so um, what you do is you'd look at um, if you're doing uh, heavy duty like VLP, you know, looking for sensitive data in all of the packets um, and you have a high transaction rate, you might uh, allocate more resources to the enforcer. Question, I see a question. Hmm. Uh, yes, Glenn, I have a question. Uh, first, thank you for all that you are showing us. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, you have, a, I think, a great tool that covers a lot of things. So I think it's very useful. Uh, so for the scanners, you said that you reset them daily for scanning for uh, updated database. I wonder when you are scanning the containers that are running, are you storing the the, the software bill of materials of the containers and then apply new versions of the databases to check for new vulnerabilities or you have to recheck what is inside the containers? Yeah, we're only gonna um, rescan, we have to rescan the container if there's a new CVE database update. And so we will rescan, let's say an image um, or a container if there's a new CVE database update. <laughs> Okay, and, and a second question, I, I have to say, I would love to ask a thousand questions, but I will be brief. Just a, a second question. Uh, when you were explaining that to check for behavior, what is normal behavior, and then detect if the, the, there is a deviation, I think that's very, very uh, interesting and not quite done in the container world uh, very much. Uh, is that mainly network activity or are any other kind of signals that you are looking into? Uh, yeah, another good question. So I'll cover all of that. So um, with the network activity, the first thing somebody might do is run their workloads in a test environment. And then New Vector will uh, use behavioral learning to observe that uh, workload. And we will see the network connections. Let's say you have an application stack. We will see those and then uh, what application protocol is being used. So that will be used to pre-populate the allowed activity for that uh, workload. And same with processes. We will observe the process activity. If you've um, put a specific file 
um, that you want to monitor in the container as well, we will then monitor that and look at the file activity and populate a file access list uh, as well. So that's one thing that people could do to help build this allow list. Now with this um, open source release 5.0, we've also added something called zero drift. And that is where we can scan the container in a runtime environment and uh, know what processes should be allowed, you know, based on the parent process and file activity should be there. Uh, and that works if you've hardened your containers and you've re removed uh, unnecessary packages and libraries and services. So that's actually a default mode now where you can lock down your container to the zero drift mode and anything that's not part of the, what we scan will be considered a violation and can just be alerted or we can actually block that process or file activity. <laughs> Thank there's, you much. there's other things that we're looking for, which is built in, which are network threats. I think there's a slide for that later. So we're, we actually have built in um, packet inspection for things like ping death and SQL injection and, and other types of common uh, uh, tunneling type of attacks and things like that. Thank you. Um, and just in case anybody's curious, we do, there is a blog post on, um, uh, there's a new MITRE attack framework for containers. Um, and of course we cover all of the container-based um, attack vectors for MITRE. Uh, but we make a point that when you're considering an attack surface for a container environment, that includes Kubernetes, that includes the host, the Linux hosts, as well as the network itself. So there are different MITRE attack matrices. Uh, in addition to containers, there's Linux and there's network. So what we've done is combined all of those together to show the, um, the coverage of uh, Open Zero Trust uh, against this uh, type of MITRE attack framework, if, if anybody's curious. <clears throat> Um, Experian is one of the public customers of the closed source product uh, before Open Zero Trust, uh, but it was compliance and runtime. I think one thing for this uh, group to know is that um, this may not be like a traditional sandbox project where it's just getting started. Uh, the technology has actually been in the market and with customers for over six years now and over a hundred companies are using it in production. So it's um, fairly well proven, I would say, and tested in various production environments. <clears throat> so uh, as Faye mentioned, one of the core technologies is uh, network deep packet inspection. And so with network deep packet inspection, you can do all of these things. <laughs> Uh, segmentation based on the application protocol. Not um, like with uh, network um, policy, you could do layer three, layer four segmentation or namespace based segmentation, uh, but it's much more flexible with Open Zero Trust. You can do application protocol segmentation. Uh, uh, break. Yep. Yeah, I'll add a little color, little bit color on this is just for, for example, the log4j, right? Uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. And because we have this technology and the interface in place, we can quickly we can quickly basically define a CRD policy for that. That policy can flow into the product, you know, download from from our website, for example. Then you have a runtime enforcement for log 4 j So it doesn't really you know, even your container is already running, you you don't want to shut it down, right? For patch, there's no patch yet. You will still get a chance to you know prevent this uh, this uh, you know zero days. So this is really a powerful automated, you know, security uh, way we're seeing. I'm happy to highlight that one. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and that's uh, WAF, WAF rules. Um, we added a uh, log4j WAF rule to the OWAS top 10 WAF rule. Um, but that WAF function that's new in 5.0 can also be used for API security. So for example, if you have a pod that needs to connect externally to an API service, 
A uh, very simple use case would be only allow HTTPS gets, but not posts. But of course you can get much more complicated and, and require things in the URL or the header or things like that. Um, one thing I wanted to point out on this list is uh, egress controls because uh, you know, one of the advisories on Log4j was you need to have and review your strict egress controls. Um, so any connections that uh, are going to be made outside of the cluster um, should be declared and identified. And you can identify those by an IP address, IP address range or subnet, or even a DNS name. So if you have a um, FQDN, and it can resolve to an external API service, then you can just put that in Open Zero Trust and only allow certain pods to connect to that API service. <clears throat> uh, and, um, you know, that's, I think, e egress controls uh, on anything out of the cluster, uh, on any protocol as well, uh, is, is one of the strengths of this technology. Uh, I have a question, sorry to interrupt. Um, um, you said sensitive data detection. Um, you are assuming that the data is tagged and labeled. And with no, it, it's more a DLP function based on regular expression matching. So basically you can define a security zone and then, and that could be a namespace or that could be an application stack in three namespaces. And let's say that's for you, it's like PCI in scope. And then any connection in or out of that will be inspected for sensitive data leakage using the exp uh, regular expression matches. So that would be looking for credit cards or account numbers or you know, uh, keywords or things like that. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, Sorry, it is an extension of the network DLP capabilities. Uh, we bring that capability into container world. So you can do PCI, SOC 2, HIPAA inspections on any sensitive information you want to check, right? Uh, tracking all the sensitive information inside this container port-to-port -port communication. Understood. Uh, I'm just trying to think implementation in a real enterprise, right? How will it work? Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, I mean, most enterprises use some standard data tagging mechanisms, right? Um, Azure has its own um, and so on and so forth, data tagging and labeling system. So does the system, I mean, we can define those in the exact data match. Um, have you seen any scalability issues with that? Typically exact data match can be very intensive, right? Oh so yeah. I yeah. I'm trying to figure <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, that's why we actually require the users, you need to define a Zoom. It cannot be check everything in the network. That's too expensive, right? So for example, we have a customers, it's a bank, right? They have a highly restricted Zoom. That Zoom maybe have a one or two applications inside. That's highly controlled. You want to draw a boundary on that Zoom. So we're going to check the boundary access only. By right? this way, you can manage, right? How heavy you would like to, you know, uh, do the check, right? Got you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's very flexible uh, capabilities. Yeah. Um, and have question. you gone to a security assessment? What, is about, what about security assessments? Um, I mean, for me to be able to use uh, a solution, I want to make sure the solution itself is secure, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, have you gone to any security assessments? <laughs> yeah, many, many times. With Sometimes customers uh, have their own. Um, but we're always doing our own hardening, our own monitoring, our own scanning, of course, vulnerability scanning. Um, and, uh, you know, occasionally uh, there'll be somebody mentioning something in a bug bounty or something like that. And we pass what I call the Glen ISO, one for the ISO standard. So we do have some sort of uh, security certificate. Oh, yeah, ISO 20243, I believe. It's kind of like supply chain security. Thank you. That's very helpful because um, the certifications uh, give like an assurance rate of trust. Thank you. Yes. Another question? Uh, yeah, quick question on the egress controls. And sorry if you already covered. Um, 
is there like a learning mode available with egress controls or do we have to like proactively add all the list of firewall rules or something like that? <laughs> uh, you know, th this is something that many people struggle with. And um, so new vector can learn those, but it will learn it based upon the destination IP, um, which is <clears throat> um, resolved after the DNS lookup. And so we can produce a report. Let's say you run in a uh, testing environment or even production. Uh, after some amount of time, you can export a report which has all the, the destination IP addresses. Um, one of the feature requests that we're looking at is if there's a DNS resolution to kind of capture that and try to, you know, kind of map that with the resolved IP to make it easier for IT teams. Because a lot of times the security or DevOps teams don't know, uh, and they aren't told by the application teams about what type of egress they're gonna put in their app. And uh, so they can't you know, go back to them and say, what are all these IPs? Are they valid? Are they not valid? So um, yeah, of course you can declare those in CRDs and have developers put those in. Uh, the most efficient way would be to declare those through DNS name, um, but you can also do that for specific destination IPs. Does that answer the question? Got it. Yeah, that that definitely answers because like most of the times it's difficult, like especially for developers to know like what egress IPs they are connecting to, um, having some kind of report, uh, as you mentioned, that, that, that definitely helps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one other thing that's very useful, even for developers, is this network uh, packet capture and forensics. Uh, so you can, uh, at any time, either in test or in production, uh, trigger, uh, it's essentially PCAP, um, 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 TCP dump, uh, network capture uh, on any pod. So the value is you just say, okay, I want this pod and I want to capture packets for two minutes or five minutes or however long. And then you can just look at that in Wireshark and debug it. Uh, or if there's an attack in progress, then you could use the REST API to script uh, automating, turning on packet capture for some amount of time. So you capture that. If there are, uh, I mentioned built-in threat detection. So like SQL injection or ping death, if those are detected by uh, Open Zero Trust, it, it will automate uh, the packet capture. So we'll automatically you know, capture the packet and make it available as well. Yeah, this is a very cool feature. A uh, lot of customer like a lot. Basically, when we capture something, blocks it automatically, then in the log, right? It will show the raw packet for you right away. So you will see the circuit injection, what's, what's inside, right? What, what exactly it is. Right, right away in the logs. It's everything happening automatically. And people have used it not just even not for security purposes as well. Sometimes the application has some malformed connection, um, missing some part of that connection, and that's it's not the application isn't working, so it helps to debug the application as well. Um, I think I talked about behavioral inspection, looking at east, west, pod to pod, uh, north, south, heat packet inspection. Um, I should mention we talk about layer seven, application layer, protocol detection like SQL, my, no MongoDB, even just SSL. Um, New Vector can or Open Zero Trust can. Uh, create uh, rules based on layer three, layer four. So you can do IP address and port based um, rules as well. Uh, Multi-cluster, you can have a, a manager and designate it as the federation head and, and then connect a bunch of Kubernetes clusters and the managers to it. And then from a single manager, be able to uh, monitor and manage a bunch of different clusters across different clouds as well. So this is the list of uh, sources that we use to build the CVE database. 
Um, and occasionally we get special requests. Uh, for example, the Microsoft Mariner one at the bottom uh, was from a team at Microsoft that has, has their own format for publishing vulnerabilities. Uh, but not just the um, packages and libraries, but also the languages, Java, Python, Ruby, Node.js, and the dependencies as well. Hey, Glenn, there is a question in chat uh, ask about vulnerability update process. Uh, maybe you yeah. So chance. the scanner image and and container uh, is running, and that contains the vulnerability, the latest vulnerability database, or file, and we publish a new one uh, almost uh, as often as daily. Anytime there's new vulnerabilities, so the update process is uh, there's a default cron job in the updater image that just restarts the scanner, and it's a pull uh, pull always. Um, and uh, so that will get the latest scanner image from our Docker Hub repo, and uh, and 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 uh, and, and uh, update the scanner uh, database. And yeah, scanner. basically, it's a, it's a live updates right through the container through Docker Hub. Basically, if you have the Docker Hub connection, you know you can just uh, enable the cron job. It will automatically grab all the latest CVE database then automatically refresh the system, then automatic scan when something new happens, you know, you have some modules will be impacted. We, we will notice that automatically. Uh, so it's, it's all live updates uh, enabled. Yeah, and that uh, brings to another point, which is uh, Open Zero Trust is designed to work in an air-gapped environment where there are no internet connections. In fact, many financial services and government are like that. Um, so that's why this process is you decide when you're gonna pull the latest scanner image. And if you need to pull it into a temporary repo, that's part of your process and then manually uh, re review it and then pull it into your air gapped environment, you can do that. There's no external connections that any of the images uh, try to initiate outward from uh, any of the technologies. Yeah, and that's perfectly fair. Um, I'd more so be interested on in having like a discussion about that paradigm of, you know, the latest tag it gets negative connotations and it makes a lot of sense in this instance. So I totally get that. Um, but from the, the varying perspectives of needing to allow list that in my policy engines, as well as, you know, things like if I am delivering this as a, a capability of my platform, um, then I want to, uh, in most cases have a deterministic declarative um, product versus something with latest that kind of introduces change more so than I would like, but I get it. And so if I opened up like a GitHub issue just to discuss this and say, here's why that decision was made, I, I think that would be uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that that's a great input. Um, uh... So we struggle with that. And, uh, and so we require that like the version tags on the manager controller enforcer, um, and then just the scanner and updater are, are recommended to be the latest. Um, you know, we've talked about separating the file out that gets updated. So, you know, you could just get the latest file. So you didn't have to pull a latest. So there's if there's some solutions to that, that makes sense. That's good input as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so we talk about layer seven, uh, deep packet inspection. This is uh, you know, kind of a list of uh, the multi-protocol um, detection for the project, as well as all the application protocols. Uh, so, uh, it, it just makes your segmentation rules uh, a lot more flexible and at the same time specific, you know, that this pod can connect to this pod, but it can only connect using the MongoDB protocol. And if any other protocol is attempted, then that's considered a violation. <clears throat> uh, and one more thing, uh, this doesn't mean we only support these protocols, right? As in the pro protocol is like a stack. You know, we don't, for example, if there's a homegirl protocols, for some services, that's fine. 
we're gonna maybe block and then monitor at the TCP level. We, we cannot go up to a next level, but if we have, a, if it's based on HTTP, we're gonna go to HTTP, then not go to next. So it's, it's a stack, right? Yeah. And then this is the list of uh, network threats that are built in. Um, these are some of the most um, kind of common critical ones. And then with the new WAF capability in, in 5.0, uh, all of the OWASP top 10 can be added as WAF rules to detect other types of uh, front end web application attacks. <clears throat> Uh, but you can see, you know, built in things like looking for DNS tunneling, ICMP tunneling that are used to ex exfiltrate sensitive data. <clears throat> um, I talked about security as code. This is an example of uh, the um, CRD, uh, you know, typical YAML format in a custom uh, resource for new vector, new NV security rule. And it's going to declare uh, the allowed behavior for workloads. So, um, and of course, that can be built into your whole uh, security as code workflow. Uh, initially, we supported CRDs for the core runtime security rules like network process and file, uh, but we've extended that in 5.0 with uh, admission control rules and uh, WAF rules and DLP rules. So we'll continue to use CRD as a declarative security uh, mechanism. Uh, we can work with uh, various service meshes, uh, Istio, uh, Linkerd, uh, AWS app mesh. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned, we're, uh, our position is on the host, uh, but uh, so with that position, we are able to inspect the traffic between the sidecar and the workload. So if you have a service mesh deployed, you have TLS encryption turned on, uh, we can still do all the deep packet inspection between the workload and the sidecar before it gets encrypted. And then of course, on the other end, after it gets decrypted. So uh, all of the rules can still work even in a service mesh uh, type of environment. Oh, a build slide, packet capture, <laughs> quarantine, we could do quarantine. Um, uh, this is, maybe I'll jump to the demo. Um, any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question, but maybe I will wait until your demo. Maybe you, you're going to answer that for me. You do the demonstration. Okay. Thank you. So the, this is the manager uh, 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 web console for the Open Zero Trust project deployments. And so this will be a view of a single cluster. And we summarize the security risk, which we calculate. There's a whole algorithm that we use to calculate. Uh, depending on how many vulnerabilities there are, are there ingress and egress connection? Is it in a monitor protect mode? Uh, all of those things. So it's kind of like a simple, and there's even a wizard to step through to uh, uh, tackle various um, issues to uh, improve your security score. Uh, I think I'll just highlight multi-cluster just quickly. So, um, you know, I can easily switch to another cluster. I think it somehow got disconnected here. Maybe that cluster is not uh, running properly. Oh yeah, it somehow it got disconnected. Um, but the, the way it works is this manager is used as the primary and then you connect other uh, manage or other uh, controllers from other clusters into this manager. <clears throat> and then you can manage all of those from here. One thing about the multi-cluster is there's something called federated policy. And so, you know, we talked about network rules and process rules, mission control rules. 
if you can create these at a federated level, and if you create a rule here, it will be pushed down to all of the joined clusters. And so this way, if you have a central security group and this one says no external connections using SSH, we want to block that, but we want to allow some Redis connections. Um, we want to have a demission control rule. If any specific one has log for J, then block it. You know, those can just be pushed down to all of the clusters. And the local admin who, who accesses that cluster individually uh, cannot change any of these federated rules um, or delete them uh, uh, because they need it to be a special role called federated admin to be able to do that. <clears throat> so that's kind of a summary of multi-cluster. And then uh, this is a real cool uh, visual view of uh, all of the workloads running in the cluster and uh, this is a live view, which includes live views of network traffic. So the lines in blue would be uh, where we've detected or you've declared that those connections should be allowed. And there's a rule specifically allowing that. Uh, and the lines in red would be violations, potential attacks, unauthorized external connections, and things like that. And in a- That is cool. <clears throat> Thanks. In a, in a true enterprise environment, this uh, would be a very complicated map. So you, you need to um, filter it on namespace or you know some means like I just did to the demo group. And then we auto collapse uh, different deployments. So this is three pods running in a deployment. And then if I click on one of these, I can see an external connection was attempted to this IP address and it was blocked. And I can click on that. It's probably going to Google or Amazon uh, as a demo. <clears throat> and we can also show you, I, uh, I'm not generating any live network traffic now, but, uh, but uh, you can see all uh, open connections. Uh, and, and as you um, generate traffic, you'll and you do this auto refresh, you'll see actually connections start to open up and close if they're short-lived connections. So it's a good way to, to see which uh, connections are being hit at any point in time. There's a bunch of stuff you can see. Um, you can do packet capture, discover, change the mode, quarantine. Uh, you can see details about how many pods are in this deployment, the rules that apply, uh, you know, various other um, uh, IP address and things like that. Under assets, this is where we're going to show you the Kubernetes platform, 1, 2, 23, no vulnerabilities detected. Um, the hosts themselves, any vulnerabilities in the hosts, any compliance, uh, CIS benchmark uh, violations or warnings. And for same for containers, you can see a specific container and see vulnerabilities, compliance information, uh, even, um, you know, we're not a, we're not a application monitoring system, but uh, you can pull some stats on CPU and memory and network usage of different pods. Hey, uh, Glenn. <clears throat> yeah. Just a, a quick time check. It is uh, two o'clock Eastern. So we're towards the end of our uh, meeting here today. So if we could briefly wrap up. Sure. Maybe thing offline. <laughs> yep. Okay. So uh, let's do registries. This is where you do your registry scanning. Uh, and then policy is really all of the runtime security, network rules, process rules, uh, admission control rules, and you could do that in a monitor or, or block mode. Um, and uh, you can see here that we have a PSP uh, equivalent rule uh, for convenience for people that uh, are migrating from PSP. Where did my PSP sample rule go? Hmm. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, and we will be adding a PSA equivalent sample rule as well for 125, uh, 125 customers. 
Um, this is where you set up the DOP and WAF rules. Uh, this is where you manage all your vulnerabilities and export reports and do remediation and compliance notice, uh, notices. And this is where you do security, you monitor for security events. One thing I should mention is we don't have a database. So everything is really meant to be integrated with a SIM or a Prometheus Grafana. Um, so all of these events that you see here are held in memory and are meant to really go up to a SIM to be processed and alerted there. Uh, but you can do a webhook for any of these. And um, so if the entire cluster were to come down, then the latest um, you know, kind of in-memory uh, security event log would um, go away. So, uh, and we do store configuration information in a PVC, uh, but we don't store event info. Um, uh, in a database of any sort. Um, support for role-based access controls, uh, LDAP, SAML, OpenID, single sign-on. So all of those enterprise integrations are supported with the project. All right, so I think that's a quick tour. Any, any last questions we can answer? Uh, I have two very quick questions uh, yeah. first. You were showing a CRD for a security policy. Uh, yeah. One thing that I am interested in and working with, and this is also an open question for anybody that can give me an answer. We want to detect drift in configuration for objects like that in the cluster. So maybe somebody got a token and have cluster admin and are modifying those CRD. We are currently trying to use Prometheus alerts and doing things to check if the objects have been tampered with, but we would rather use an automated tool if somebody knows something that can check mm -hmm. that kind of things. Yeah, the CRD I showed you an example of. Um, Gary, so we do have some things planned for more configuration uh, auditing and, and therefore drift. We, you can upload a deployment YAML and then we will look at it and, and tell you what things do not meet your admission control rules if you have certain requirements in your deployment YAML. Um, and I guess, Gary, are we looking at CRD um, auditing as well? Yeah, well, that, that's one of the roadmap uh, items. Uh, so we're going to add you know, monitoring, auditing of the system Kubernetes configuration, including not just the pod, right? uh, but also services, secrets, all those things. But CRD, if there is a, how do, you say, how do I say, a, a, a model that you can define that's the, the golden standard, then we can check if that's gotten modified, or, or we can report if someone modified that. Right? In any, in any case, I will uh, maybe propose for another meeting to explain my use case that takes time to understand because for me it's like extending the, the supply chain, not on the validity of the containers, but also the configuration that is deployed alongside and that's a yeah. gap I am yeah. finding there. And maybe, maybe that way we can yeah. share more ideas. Yeah, maybe create the issues in our work in yeah. half, so we're gonna follow up with you on details. Perfect. And uh, today Perfect. we do have uh, some checks already. For example, we already checked some tokens in the environment, mm -hmm. auto scan all the tokens out. But uh, you know, I know you have more detailed use cases we can, we can follow up. Uh, I, I, I will do that. And, and the second one is for the share of uh, for, for everybody also to, to know. I believe you have webinars we can add it to know more and, and more, do more questions and, and see more about this too, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And if there's specific questions uh, for those, we can make sure we dive deep into those areas. Um, Faye mentioned the, you know, create an issue in the GitHub. So I don't know if yeah. we if were clear in that the currently there's a GitHub under the new vector organization. So new vector slash new vector has all the source code. You can create issues there today, but uh, our plan, and we do have the open zero trust org on GitHub as well. And our plan is to move all that into that uh, GitHub repo uh, within the next few weeks. So, uh, you know, you can create issues uh, anywhere for now, but eventually yes. they'll Keep in mind that. be on the- Yeah. 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 So we will manage that uh, open the trust as the upstream. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a goal, yeah. yeah. Perfect, thank you very much. Other questions, anyone?
Yeah. Well, we thank you for your time. Uh, we're very excited to submit this and to have it as part of an open source community. So we love all the input on it. Yeah, great product. Thank you so much for the demo. Thanks, everyone. So, John, I assume we can follow up for the for the next steps or whatever advices. Please, please feel free to let us know. Great. All right, everyone. Thank okay. you all. Have a good Thank day. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. See bye. you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.